church. I welcome everyone to our leadership development tonight in Jesus' name. Remember that you are here, one, as a Christian, two, as a worker, three, as a leader, and so you wear different caps. And as you learn from the Word of God, you're learning for yourself, you're learning for your local church, you're learning for the people you're leading. And so, have a serious mind to receive everything God is sending to you, so that in all the various aspects that you stand, you'll be a benefit to the body of Christ in Jesus' name. A good, good amen. amen. Father, we thank you tonight and bless your name. Thank you for the joy of being counted as a real child of God and for being counted as a disciple of Christ. And you have sent us, you are sending us to your people so as to bring them up in the way of the Lord. And we pray that your work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're reading from 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 1. Likewise ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. As I read that verse, number one, I read to you as a Christian wife. Number two, I read to you as a worker, having wives of husbands under your leadership. And you're going to help them, you're going to transform them, and you're going to mold them to the image of a Christian wife. So that this verse, number one, you take it for yourself. Number two, if you're all right by yourself, you take it to also mean you're going to influence the Christian women to be obedient to the word of God. If you're a pastor, if you're a leader, you're a man, you're not a wife, you want to ask yourself, how can I be of benefit to the church and to the families of the church so that my ministration, so that my preaching will help the wives to be obedient to the word of God? It says there are unbelieving husbands having believing wives. Those unbelieving husbands and not hearing the word of God. And so the word being preached in evangelism, in the bus, on the street, in the church, is not winning them. And you as a wife, you want to so live that your character alone, your conduct alone, will be the means of convicting the man, your husband, convincing the man, your husband, and converting the man, your husband. And you as a wife, that's what you are thinking. If your husband happens to be an unbeliever, now, if you're a woman leader, and you have women under you, and these women are Christians, sincere Christians, born-again Christians, but the complaint is, I'm having a hard time at home. Because my husband is not a believing man. He doesn't believe the Bible. And if I bring any message home, he is not going to listen. This verse is saying that you as a woman leader, you will so teach, you will so transform that woman, that Christian woman, that her character, if the husband is not hearing the word, and cannot be warned by the word that we're preaching that your own chaste conversation, your own lifestyle at home, will win that husband unto the Lord. Here you are, you are a pastor, and you are counseling, 
and the women come for counseling or the men come for counseling maybe the man says my wife has given me a hard time my wife is not a believer my wife is like this or that the counseling you give is not to tell him go back home and deal with that woman go back home and shape her up go back home and do something that that woman will know that you are the head no the message is you will train this man christian man that he will go back home that if the word the bible will not convert the wife the man should so live and so comport himself that the character of the man will convert the woman and so as you look at the passage you look at this passage from those pers perspectives number one for yourself for your family number two for the people you are leading come back to verse one likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands and if you are going to influence uh, christian women to be in subjection to their husbands you need to understand there are many voices talking to that christian wife and the culture of the land and the modern day society and the internet and the women activists and all the other people that influence the family they teach in the opposite direction they say stand for your right they say claim your right they say if the man will divorce you don't mind just stand for your right and stand firm because of all the other voices that are talking to the women and these women are now with you and the husbands too as they are acting somehow in the home the husband is reacting if you want to go you can go if you want uh, to divorce you can divorce if you want to marry your church go and marry your church here is where i stand you want to help that woman that the woman listening to all these voices in the world will come down and will understand you don't want your husband to go to hell you want to influence your husband you want to be the salt in the family and so you have a great work to do it's not just that we'll come here and it was okay i need to be a christian husband of course i need to love my wife of course i need to submit to my husband of course go beyond that you have hundreds and perhaps thousands of women that need you that will bring them to this passage and your ministry and your ministration will make them to be what they ought to be look at verse 2 while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear that is not slavish fear it's reverential fear it's respect it's honor that you are teaching the women, you are teaching the Christian women that they should honor their husbands and they should respect their husbands. The culture in which we live, especially as the culture has been influenced by all the media and everything we hear about, the culture is saying 50 50. You divide the attention and you divide everything. If he takes 50, you take 50 and don't submit and don't bow and don't bend whatever will happen you have your right to defend and you need to teach them that if we do that we're going to lose our homes if we do that we're going to lose our children that these christian women that are under our teaching they will have chaste conversation coupled with respect and honor Who's adorning? Let it not be the outward adorning of plating the air and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. You know, that's the in thing in the world. Uh, some of the women that even want to win their husbands, they want to win them over to their way of thinking. 
They say the man, you know, in his office, on the street, and everywhere, he sees a lot of women and is attracted to them. And if I'm going to keep my man, I should dress higher, I should dress more flamboyant than all those women outside, so that they'll not take my husband away from me. That the world in which we live now, the women don't care that the man has a wife at home, they will so dress to turn his head. And so the women under our care will think, if I don't dress to match those other women outside, turning the head of my husband, if I don't go beyond them, I might lose the man. How do we teach a such a Christian woman that no, you know, all that outward appearance will not win the man over. But it says in verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. That's the heart of the matter. The heart in the marriage. It says, as you are teaching those women, and you are influencing those women, let them understand. Have you seen beautiful women that uh, cannot keep their homes? Have you seen those who are dressed up and painted up and with all the cosmetics of the world that still cannot keep their home? Let them understand. And, and it is your duty that as you keep your own family, you want to keep the hundreds and the thousands of the families in the church, in your local church, that it will be the hidden man of the heart in that way which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That's another area where we need to understand and we need to teach our Christian women that it's good to speak out, it's good to talk, but you know, sometimes we talk too much, I cannot take that, I will not take that, I will not stomach that. Whatever you want to do, you can do. But I want to tell you, I'm a woman of value. I'm a woman of weight. I know who I am. Our women and the women we are trying to help, they talk too much. Let's understand that as we ourselves live in the family, we want to cultivate the attitude of a meek and quiet spirit. And that's what we're teaching other people. Understand? You are a pastor. You are also a pattern. As a pattern, you demonstrate it in your home. As a pastor, what you have demonstrated at home, you want to bring to the families in the church. And it says, it's that quiet spirit and that mixed spirit that is of great value in the sight of God. For after this manner, in old time, Holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. And the apostle Peter is now going into history and is going to the Old Testament. It's not only one example of Sarah, it's she, it says holy women also in the plural. This, they trusted in the Lord. They didn't think my own action will bring the man down. My own action will subdue that man. My own action will make him cooperate. My own action will make him come to my side. Only women that we have learned about, they didn't act like that. Abigail didn't act like that to that uh, person. The husband was a child who was a, a wicked person. But it is with their subdued attitude, as they trusted in the Lord, they adorned themselves with inner beauty, being in subjection to their own husbands. Even as Sarah and, and obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and she did that sincerely. It's not going back home and saying, Lord, dinner is ready, Master. Breakfast is ready. No, that's mocking the scripture. That's making a caricature of the scripture. But as a pattern in your own heart, you're submissive, you're subdued. The grace of God comes to you. And because you are a pattern already, an example already, you can teach other women to, uh, to help in their families in this way and it says whose daughters ye are as 
long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement and not afraid with any amazement huh. i know my husband if i yield an inch he'll take a mile i know my husband if i close my eyes i know what he will do you are afraid with amazement if i obey the scriptures if i submit to that man that man i know him is going to take advantage of me you're afraid with amazement but it says obey the scriptures and leave the result in the hands of god and that's what we're teaching other women too as a pastor that's what we're teaching the women too as leaders in the church that's what we're teaching other women too that they will not be afraid they'll trust in god and they have faith in god and god is going to give the outcome that he will give in verse 7 likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge dwell with them according to knowledge let the family be a school let your marriage be a school be observant and learn and when it says the women of weaker weaker vessel not all women are the same your own wife in particular learn what might discourage her what might break her down what might make her sad what might make her totally confused you learn from your, your own wife you'll be living together now for a year for two or for 10 or for 20 or for 30 you understand in which area her emotion will take the better part of her you understand in which area bad news will take the better part of a you understand a comment that you make that will take the better part of her that's what he's talking about he's not talking about uh, you know weakness in the physical just like that there are women who drive and there are men who drive the same kind of car the same kind of bus there are women who fly the plane and uh, men also fly the plane there are women who are medical doctors there are men who are medical doctors there are women who are scientists and they are very intelligent and there are men also it's not talking about that it's talking about her emotion her life and the things that can easily weaken her and it says as you learn as you study and as you understand your wife you will live with her giving her honor giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel as being heirs together of the grace of life heirs together of the grace of life don't depreciate the grace of god in her life and also don't depreciate yourself of the grace of god in your life that your prayers be not hindered your prayers will not be hindered in jesus name tonight i'm talking to you on raising a worthy bride for a wealthy bridegroom raising a worthy bride you're raising up the church there are husbands in the church who are raising them up. There are wives in the church who are raising them up. There are families in the church who are raising them up. And there are people who are not married in the church. You are raising them up. All of them together, all the church, they are like a bride, a worthy bride. And Christ is the bridegroom. And you are raising up a worthy bride for a wealthy bridegroom and let's look at uh, ephesians chapter 5 and i'm reading from verse 22 ephesians chapter 5 reading from verse 22 it says wives submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the lord by the way paul the apostle who wrote this was not married and by inspiration even though he wasn't married he was raising up a worthy bride for the wealthy bridegroom he was raising up the body of christ and some part of the body of christ are wives and so he taught them by the spirit wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the lord verse 25 husbands love your wives even as christ 
and you remember he wasn't married he's not even showing a pattern by himself by his own example but by the spirit because he understands as an apostle as a pastor as a shepherd as a leader he needed to raise up the wives and the husbands to match what Christ expects. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love, so love, so love his wife, even as himself. And the wives see that she reverence her husband. We are coming to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, I read from verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. The Lamb, that's our Savior, the Lamb, that's our Lord, the Lamb, that's the one that brought us into the kingdom. He has a wife, that's the church. He has a bride, that's the church. You want to help in the ministry that you're not thinking, you're not only thinking of your little family, you're thinking of the bride of Christ. And it says that bride, look at verse 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's according. We need to raise up a worthy bride for the wealthy bridegroom. The revelation between the relationship between the husband and the wife is mirrored from that of Christ and the church. Mirrored from that of the bridegroom and the bride as ministers labor to raise and to build up happy and healthy earthly families so must we also labor to raise and build up Christ's holy and heavenly family Christ's holy and heavenly family in Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3 here I read from verse 14 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named the whole family patch now in heaven and patch here on earth and the family of Christ the bride of Christ all the members of the body of Christ that come under your leadership you want to help to raise them up and you want to help to transform them you want to help to make them to please the Lord raising a worthy bride for a wealthy bridegroom three things we're looking at number one the leadership of willing ministers and watchmen if this is our call to raise up a bride if this is our call to transform the bride of Christ we're willing to do that the leadership of willing ministers and watchmen point number two the love of win some members and workers Win some members and workers I want to help our members to be winsome as the bride of Christ to talk like a bride and to act like a bride and to speak that even if their neighbors are not coming to our church or to a Bible believing church their character as the bride of Christ will win those neighbors and win them to the Lord the love of winsome members and workers point number three the loyalty to the worthy master and well spring the master the Messiah Jesus Christ our Savior he is the wellspring 
of all we need and we need to have loyalty to him it's a family and he is the head of the family and we are members of that of that family and we need to have loyalty to that worthy master and wellspring point number one please tell me number one the lord will make you a good leader and days that god expects the lord will fulfill through your ministry my ministry our ministry together in jesus name i want you to look at first peter chapter 3 first peter chapter 3 verse 1 likewise 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 verse 7 likewise you see he has given us a standard for the wife likewise then he goes on for the husband likewise then he goes on it's been talking about the community it's been talking about masters and servants it's been talking about the civil society it's been talking about how we need to be submissive and obey and now he says likewise your wives likewise you husbands and let's look at what he's saying i want you to see in chapter 2 verse 18 chapter 2 verse 18 servants be subject to your masters with all fear oh not only to the good and gentle but also to the fraud come to chapter 3 verse 1 likewise ye wives be in subjection you know what he's saying he's saying this is everywhere in the society there's a king we need to submit to that king there are the governors we need to submit to those governors and there are the leaders in such we need to submit to them and there are masters in places of work servants we need to submit to them likewise your wives be in subjection to your own husbands likewise ye husbands deal with them according to knowledge we're looking at first peter chapter 3 verse 8 first peter chapter 3 i read from verse 8 verse 8 of first peter chapter 3 likewise you see that it's telling us that we shouldn't excuse ourselves we shouldn't separate ourselves we shouldn't stand in isolation there is something god expects in the whole of society and he's saying are you a wife likewise fit in are you a husband likewise fit in are you an employer likewise fit in are you an employee likewise fit in and he's telling us that as leaders whatever situation and whatever position our members may hold our workers may hold our ministers may hold we should bring them back to what has been reaching for everyone likewise look at verse, that verse 8 likewise must the deacons be grave not double tongued not giving to much wine not greedy or filthy lucre then in verse 9 holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience it says uh, the pure conscience is very important in the family in the place of work in the church likewise everyone titus chapter 2 i read from verse 3 titus chapter 2 reading from verse 3 in verse 3 it says the aged women likewise you see what he's telling us when he uses that word likewise he's saying this goes across the whole of the church this cuts across everywhere and no one is going to ha say i have my own perspective i have my own perception i have my own thinking about that i have my own way of living likewise everyone don't isolate yourself in verse 3 the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness 
not false accusers, nor giving too much wine, but teachers of good things. Teachers of good things. You will not teach a Christian wife to be rebellious at home. Teachers of good things. You will not tell a Christian wife, see what you are going through. Well, I cannot tell you what to do to your husband, but you know what? I will not take that from my husband. You're teaching her to go back home and rebel. You're teaching her to go back home and not to improve on her character, not to improve on her gentleness, not to improve on her own manner of life that will win the husband. You're teaching her to go and show her him the other side of women. Deny him. Suspend every activity or thing. Do this and do that. Let him know that you are a person of distinct personality. Go show him at home. He says, No, likewise, ye aged women, that she will teach them, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be, to be sober and to love their children and to love their husbands we're coming to that same chapter verse 6 verse 6 young men likewise you see what he's saying he's saying that all the people that are under our leadership under our instruction we're teaching them that same sobriety that same submissiveness and you're not teaching anyone to rebel in her home in his family you're not teaching any child as a youth leader uh, to say your dad does that at this your age well this is how you will act if you left home and they were looking for you they cannot find you after they now discover where you are after three months and then if you come back home your parents will submit your father will be subdued. Your mother will not tell you something like that anymore. Show them how the young people can be people of their mind and they can give it to their parents and their parents will be extra careful how they deal with them. You can do that. Likewise, young men, you are to exhort to be sober-minded in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing on corruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil sin to say of you that's what the Lord is expecting that we will do and you see it cuts across the whole church 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 I read from verse 2 I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ he's talking to the old church of the Corinthians he said you Corinthians I'm jealous over you I have the jealousy of Christ the husband I have the jealousy of Christ the bridegroom I'm watching over you I don't want any other man, any other institution, any other society to have an inroad into you. I don't want any rival to Christ in your life. I don't want any rival to Christ in your submission. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy because I have espoused you to one husband one husband and i want you to remain a loving bride to that one husband that i may present you as a chaste virgin to christ colossians chapter 1 verse 28 colossians chapter 1 verse 28 whom we preach warning every man 
and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You know what the apostle here is saying? He's saying, I am not winning you to myself. I'm winning you to Christ. I am not wooing you to myself. I am wooing you to Christ. I am not demanding that you'll be attached to me. I'm demanding you'll be attached unto Christ. You see, we miss our way and we lose our ministry. When we win any woman in the church to ourselves, away from the husband, and we win their loyalty, we win their submission, and we don't allow them to obey their husbands, winning them to ourselves, we lose our calling, and we will win any member to ourselves and not to Christ, and we do not remind them, you are a bride of Christ. You are not my bride, a man, a woman, you are not my friend, in quotes, and you are not my lover, in quotes, Jesus is the lover of your soul. In any section of the area of work we are in, if we make the people under our leadership to forget the watch of God and to forget their faithfulness to God and to forget their loyalty to Christ and we win them to ourselves, we have done wrong. We have lost the ministry. We are to win the people unto Christ as a loving, loyal, submissive, and faithful bride. Win them and win them to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, I read from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Now there's something we call etiquette, home etiquette. And there are people who are not uh, Christians. There are people who are not born again uh, and they observe that. They want to come uh, out of a leech to say, you go first, women first. And they want to have any sin. Uh, maybe both of them need that sin. You go first, have your share. After that, I had my share. That's home etiquette. And I don't believe us that do that. That they will give the first choice to their wife. Well, we Christians, if home believers can do that, how about us? That's a calling to you. But it's going beyond that. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. In the etiquette of the families in the world, the husband will try and find time to say, I love you. Once in a while, will write a note, I love you. Once in a while, I'm thinking of you. That's etiquette, that's good, that's good. But you see, Jesus did not just write a note to us, I love you. He demonstrated it by what he did. He demonstrated it by what he gave. And he gave everything to the bride, to the body of Christ, to the church. And you know, he had a mother, Mary. He didn't have to say, I'm not, I'm not going to allow my mother to be jealous of my disciples. And so I must make sure that I do everything to please my mother first. After that, my disciples. He didn't act like that. Jesus, your mother, your brothers and sister are looking for you. And he replied, who is my mother? Who is my brother? And who are my sisters? Then he pointed to his disciples, these that hear the word of God and obey the word of God. They are my sister, my brother, my mother. He gave number one place in love to the bride, to the church. The same thing is telling us to do that you as a person, as a husband, you will not love your mother or your family that you came from more than your wife. Your wife is number one. And if we are the pattern, 
that's what we're teaching all the other people too under our leadership come back to verse 25 husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church is the love that includes forgiveness is the love that includes meekness is the love that includes gentleness and then it says and gave himself for each he gave not that he was doling out money like to a primary school girl uh, that's enough and then he's keeping a lot of money somewhere and the wife will not know he gave himself i pray god will help us to give ourselves I didn't hear the amen. amen. And you know, there are preachers and pastors that we have need in the church, of course. We need money in the church, of course. But you cannot teach the husband in the family and say, your wife is asking for this. I hope you don't respond to all that. And then you laugh, you giggle. I'll say because you know we need a lot of money in the church now let him do what he ought to do to his wife and don't use the excuse of needing money in the church and needing money for this project to then be hardened against his wife every husband you teach must love the wife his own wife in particular as christ has loved the church and he gave himself for the church. The Lord will help us. And then in that same Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. There's a duty, there's a responsibility as leaders, as pastors. He said he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the perfecting of the bride for the perfecting of the of the members of the body of christ for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto a perfect man, that's your ministry, unto a perfect man, that's your calling, unto a perfect man, that's what the Lord wants you to concentrate on, teaching the men, teaching the women, teaching the young people, teaching the father, teaching the mother, teaching the children, teaching the husband, and teaching the wife, and every member of every family to come to a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The Lord will help us. The Lord will help me. I said the Lord will help me. Point number two now. The love of winsome members and workers. We're coming to First Peter chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 1. First Peter chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word they also the men the husbands who are not obeying the word also may without the word without the preaching without the ministry of the pastor he doesn't accept the pastor they may be won by the conversation of their wives he's saying that you should tune up it should sharpen, it should improve on your communication at home, improve on your conduct at home, improve on your character at home. 
that even if your husband refuses to listen to uh, the preacher, too much holiness, holiness. I don't, I don't want to listen to that man. And too much uh, scriptures. He wants to read the whole of the Bible in one single message. I don't want to listen to that man. But even though your husband may not want to come to church with you to listen to the word of God, by your character, by your conversation, by your conduct, by your manner of life, by your meekness and gentleness, he will be convicted, he'll be convinced, he'll be converted. They may be won by the conversation of their wives while they behold, while they behold, they're watching you. You say you go to deeper life, they're watching you. You say you go to church, they're watching you. You say you go here and there, I go to retreat, I go to conference, I go to congress. They will not come, they may not come, but they're watching you. While they behold, you spend so much, so many hours in the church. What are you learning there? What are you doing there? If they cannot see the evidence of what you are learning, while they behold your chaste conversation, your pure conversation, your reasonable conversation, your winsome conversation, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear. And then he tells us in verses 5 and 6, For after this manner, in old time, holy women also, holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves. It was their beauty, the character they demonstrated, the conduct they put forth, and the lifestyle they lived at home. They can they will not just go out. Wife will not just go out and say if that uh, fellow alone is, uh, you know, watching television, I don't want to, you know, tell him anything. If I tell him I'm going to uh, say church again, conference again, congress again, so I'll just go. He will figure out what, where I've gone. You'll not do that. He says you'll be in subjection unto your husband. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, the obedience says, according to the word of God, if the husband commands you not to do something that God wants you to do, you will know how to politely say, no, Christ is my savior, and Christ is my head, and Christ is the one who has given everything for me so I can get to heaven. And so you will not obey, but you will not rebel, you will not abuse, you will not insult, you will not behave in any cranky way, you will not behave in any crafty way, you will not behave in any volatile way that will generate or spike up anger on both sides. If you disobey, you disobey because this is what the Word of God says. That's what we're teaching the Christian women. And we're teaching the Christian men as well. There are times their husbands who want to be lord over them. And their, husbands, their wives who want to make them slaves. And we want to command them, don't go out. That's enough. Don't go to church today. I need you. And don't go to that workers or something today. I need you here. There are times the wives will be bossy. And we'll teach the husbands, you'll still be gentle, you'll still be honest, and you'll still be loving, and you'll still provide everything you need to provide, but you will not be a slave to the woman. You will be gentle, but you will still have your false loyalty unto God. You will not uh, spike off a fight. You will not start a fight. And if uh, she wants to fight, it takes two to fight. You will be quiet. You will be meek. You will be humble. But you will obey the Lord. You will suffer for that. But you will suffer graciously. You will suffer lovingly. That's what we're teaching the men. That's what we're teaching the women. That's why it says in verse 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, 
calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement at home, there should be no fear. You teach the Christian women, they will not be afraid of their husbands. That's their partner, that's their spouse, that's the help need. There's nothing to be afraid of. But, you know, his eyes are red and he's like, you know, he wants to pounce on me. You look at him face to face, eyeball to eyeball, with gentleness, with grace coming out of your eyes. And with love coming out of your eyes, and that love will subdue him. It may be the wife that says, ah, you went out when I told you not to go out. You still went to that, your holy, holy, holiness church, and I told you I needed you, and she's angry. You will not be angry. It takes two to make a fight. You look up. Look at her face. Don't look down. When you look down, you are afraid with amazement. Look at this woman. She cowers me. She makes me a slave and she makes me afraid. No, she doesn't make you afraid. You make yourself afraid. Look up and look at her with love, with gentleness, and let her see the love of God through your eyes. You're not afraid. And the same thing you're teaching what to achieve at home is what to are teaching members of the church that the wives will not be afraid in a slavish way and the husbands will not be afraid in a slavish way so that the wife does not become a slave holder, pinning him down and saying, so far you can go and not far. You see, that will not happen. My allegiance is unto Christ. I'm your husband. I am not your slave. But you say that with love. And you communicate that with love. Now it says in verse 7, likewise ye husbands, you see that he has spoken to the wives and is saying, you husbands too, let it be peace at home and be a peacemaker at home and be a person that generates the peace of God and the love of God at home. Likewise, she husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, knowledge of the scriptures, knowledge of Adam and Eve knowledge of men and women in the bible and knowledge of your wife in particular dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel that means if there's something to carry that is heavy and she wants to carry to say no darling don't carry that you can uh, kind of uh, twist your disc I'll carry that for you because you are stronger. And, or if you cannot carry, you call another person, come and carry this uh, for mommy. And when you do that, you recognize that she's weak physically and she cannot carry that thing. You deal with her, you live with her according to that knowledge as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Your prayers will not be hindered. Amen, amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You as a Christian, that love will be at home. It is the kind of love God teaches. The kind of love God inspires. Look at that verse again. As touching brotherly love, ye have a brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, but ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. If you are a person that reads uh, books, there are books that are written by marriage counselors. 
and he talked about love and his eros in Greek. It's a fleshly love in Greek, in Greek. But the kind of love that God teaches, that he has demonstrated in giving his only begotten son, because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting love. That's the kind of love God has demonstrated. That's the kind of love God has taught. And as you are teaching husbands and wives to love each other, and you are teaching members of the church to manifest that love so you can have a loving bride for a worthy bridegroom, you tell them that they are to show the love of God and the love of Christ. And you are not a person like that's a bully at home. You're not a person uh, that's a tyrant at home. You're not a person with a high hand uh, and you handle everything, even a little baby, a little child, or that, or your wife, you handle them with iron hand. You show the love and you show all the members of the church how to manifest that love. And love will be the prevailing thing in the family, not fear and not anxiety look at verse 10 and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all macedonia but we beseech you brethren that ye tell me tell me out aloud that ye increase more and more somebody shout more and more if you look at the average family, before the wedding day, the love, the texts, the interaction, the smiles, it's like this woman does not know how to be angry at anything. It's like this man does not know how to be angry at anything. Love. And then the wedding day comes and everything is rosy, everything is loving. And after one month into the marriage, that love is less and less. After two years, three years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, as the woman is getting older and weaker physically, as the woman is getting older and weaker emotionally, as the woman is getting uh, older and weaker in outlook, in outward expression, now less and less love. But you see, the love God expects from the husband to the wife, from the wife to the husband, more and more. Somebody help me shout more and more. As we look at the church, between the leader in the church and the members of the church, when we started and when you first became a member of the bride of Christ and you come into the church and the pastor preaches and it takes five minutes, you just love everything that he says. One hour, you love everything that he says. And maybe one day he decides to go beyond the regular one hour and he goes to one and a half hours. He just love what he says. There was no criticism. Let's bring it to our church here. You see, in the church, there is the head, there's a father. That's why you say, my father in the Lord. That's why he would say, my father in the Lord. Let's pray for our father in the Lord. Well, if it's the father in the Lord, is the head of the family, our family here, church family. We love him and we love more and more. Somebody shout more and more. And that means that however long he decides to preach, that's between him and God. Because of your benefit and because of giving the best to you and the love of God will still be more and more from all our members and from all our workers and from everybody in Jesus' name. More and more. 
I said more and more. We're looking at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, male singular, female singular? And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to how many wives? How many wives? And cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be, tell me, one flesh, one flesh. That means you have the same mind. You have the same goal. That means you have the same interest. One flesh. Have you noticed that Adam actually needed many hands to help? And if polygamy was the will of God, Adam should have been a polygamist. Eventually, Adam and Eve got married. And they were together. And it says for this cause, because of the example of Adam and Eve, shall a man leave father and mother and cleave and be joined to his wife and they two not three shall become one flesh and now the serpent came and beguiled Eve deceived Eve and she ate of that sin the Lord had said thou shalt not eat and gave to the husband Adam and he ate, and both of them saw their nakedness. And the Lord said, Adam, where art thou? I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid. And the Lord said, how do you know you are naked? Have you eaten of that fruit? I told you not to eat. The woman you gave me, gave me, and I did eat. Woman, what have you done? The serpent beguiled me. But the point is this, God did not create another woman for Adam. If divorce was the perfect will of God, if divorce was the expected will of God, what he did was enough to say we're breaking it up. But no, and there is nothing your wife will do that will be greater than what Eve had done in bringing the whole of humanity into the fall. And yet, no separation and no divorce. And that's what we're teaching members of our church. We're not teaching any member of the church. That's terrible. You mean your wife did that? That's enough to break it up. And you know the court? Don't say, I told you. Because they tell us in the church, ah, we tell you in the Bible, not in the church, that there's no divorce and remarriage. It is the word of God that two of them shall be one flesh. Thank God you and your wife will stay together. You and your husband will stay together. That will take forgiveness. That will take love. That will take overlooking minor minor issues that will take not raising up laws in the family where there is no law there is no sin the laws in the bible are enough we don't have to create another law don't move this way don't move that way don't do this don't do that all that laws that are even more important now than the laws in the bible it should not be so look at verse 6 wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh what therefore God has joined together somebody shout the rest out let not man put asunder thank God will obey the word of God will not be like the people that are heading to court you know this has happened that, that has happened 
no grace, no love, the court, not the Bible will settle it for us. Your family should not be like that. First Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six. I read from verse one. Dear any of you having a matter against another, go to law, the law court, before the unjust, before the unbelievers, before sinners, and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so? that there is not a wise man among you, not even your pastor, no, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren, but brother go, goest to law with brother, husband goest to law to the court with the wife, and that before the unbelievers but seven now therefore there is utterly fault among you because you go to law you go to court one with another why do ye not rather take wrong why don't you rather endure that wrong why don't you gracefully suffer that it says, why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? All that kind of abnormality will not be in our families anymore in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 3 verse 8. First Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 8. It says in verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind. To start with, every family unit, husband and wife, be all of one mind. Parents and children, be all of one mind. Fathers of the Lord and members of the church, be all of one mind. Don't be a difficult person to lead. You're part of the bride. And the bride of Christ is lowly and gentle and humble. And don't say, we'll tear it apart, we'll pull it down. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind. Be of one mind to the local leader in the church. And to the GS, the pastor, in our church deep and life. Be of one mind with him. Having compassion one of another. If your uh, husband says, I don't appreciate this, my dear, what's wrong in it? What's bad in this? You're too meticulous. You're splitting ears. There's nothing wrong with it. I understand. Nothing wrong with that. But I don't appreciate it. If you love one another, you'll not say, I'm going to do that to irritate him. I'm going to do that to jolt him. I'm going to do that to make him offended and make him offensive. And if the pastor in the church, if the GS says, this is not right, this is not the commission the Lord has given us, let's act like this, let's behave like this, let's show that we have one mind, one with another, you as a member of the church you are not there as a controller you are there and you have compassion so that there will be peace in the house of god there will be peace in our church in jesus name amen amen verse 9 finally be all of one mind how many of us are to be of one mind i can't hear my people 
be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life, you have life, and good days, you have good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil. In the family, refrain your tongue. Make that woman happy. Refrain your tongue. Make that man, your husband, happy. Refrain your tongue. Let the children grow up in a conducive, in a loving atmosphere. Refrain your tongue. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his leaves that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good and let him seek peace and seal it for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayer but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil I will not do evil you will not do evil in Jesus name we're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Don't allow the evil spirit of fear to take over your family. Because if you, you know, you open the door by your language, by your character, by your bullying, by all that, the spirit of fear can come in. And then that wife will be shaking and trembling every time. That husband will be less than a man. When the spirit of fear has taken hold of him, I pray that the spirit of fear will not take over your family. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We'll come to point number three, our loyalty to the worthy master and wellspring. Maybe that word wellspring is not, uh, you are not familiar with that word. Let me clear that up to start with. The wellspring. I'm reading from Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. And I read from verse 4. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 4 the words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook and as we talk about the Messiah and talk about the bridegroom talk about the husband of the church talk about our Savior and our Lord is the wellspring of everything we need, the wellspring of wisdom, the wellspring of love, the wellspring of every supply that we need. And we need to be loyal to him because in him and through him we have everything that we need. Our loyalty to the worthy master and wellspring. We're coming to... First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. We're reading from verse 3. In First Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of pledging the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel. Remember, we're talking about the wife and the husband. And this is in the context of husband and the wife. It says in verse 1, Ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Then it says in verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation, 
then it says whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning or pledging the air of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel is saying of course your husband wants you to be neat your husband wants you to dress well but to understand if there's pride if there is a pugnacious spirit if there is unruly language if there is rudeness towards that husband, he doesn't appreciate the outward adornment. He says, well, on the outside, she looks beautiful, but she carries a dagger in her tongue, and she carries poison acid in her words. And I don't want her to pour the acidic word on me. The husband will overlook all that beauty outside if the inside is not what it ought to be. The same thing for the bride of Christ. The same thing for the people of God. We have skill, we have beauty, we have skill, we have intelligence. But if our language, if our action is killing others, scattering the church, and spreading fear, unnecessary fear in the church, the bridegroom will say, yes, they have skill, yes, they have ability, yes, they have commitment, but their words and their works and their attitude is corrosive, is destructive. That's what the Lord is saying here. Look at verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. You are neat on the outside. You are beautiful on the outside. And you are well kept on the outside. But then you take care of the inner life more. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible. You don't bring the corruption of society in the, into the home the corruption of the world into the church even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price God looks at the inward at the inside more than the outside for Samuel chapter 16 I'm reading from verse 7 for Samuel Chapter 16, reading from verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on the outward, on the countenance, or on the height of his stature. If we're going to look on the stature, Saul, that God has rejected, was just like this, as, as for stature. He says, don't look on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 11. Neat on the outside, clean on the, out, on the inside, gentle on the inside. Your words are loving. Your words are soothing. Your words make the man, the husband, to have self-confidence, not the words that will tear down. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 11. It says, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men is looking at the heart. And it says, Put more effort into that meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price. Proverbs chapter 31 Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10 Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is above rubies. 
a heart, the heart of her husband, does simply trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She doesn't sell her husband into the hands of enemies outside. Her husband will trust in her. She will do him good, not evil, all the days of her life. She's very thoughtful. She's very careful. And she will do him good all the days of her life. And not evil. She seeketh wool and flax and walketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships that she bringeth her food from afar. She doesn't feed the family with junk, junk food. She is very thoughtful and she thinks of the health of the husband and the health of the children and the health of the household. She rises also while it is yet night, early in the morning, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. She guardeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She lays her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known. Her husband is respected in the gates. She doesn't do anything that will make those who are near workers in the household disrespect the husband or neighbors in the community to disrespect the husband. The husband is known in the gates when he sitteth seated among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth each enterprising and delivereth girdles unto the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. Verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom. She sings before she speaks. She looks before she jumps. She sings, if I say that way, Will my husband be hurt? Will my husband be unhappy? Will my husband be caught down? Am I cutting down my husband from the roots and from the branches so that the husband becomes like a dry, fruitless tree? She doesn't do that. She opens her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up, and calleth her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. And the husband will not be thinking, uh, uh, you know, I wish there were no doctrine or no divorce and remarriage. I would have gotten rid of this woman. No, she does. He doesn't think like that. And he's saying, if I need to think of marriage again, I'll marry this same woman. After many years of living together, that's what it says. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and the beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her 
in the gates. I pray that we'll be like our families. Our families will have love, grace, meekness, and will live together faithfully, lovingly, and peacefully in Jesus' name. It will happen in your family. If there are things to correct, we'll correct them today. And there you are helping members of the church in their families too as to search the pattern. Then you'll pass it across and they too will be who God wants them to be in every family. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. The Lord has spoken a lot to us on our personal lives as wives, as husbands, children in the family, and parents in the family. He has spoken to us as watchmen, as workers, as ministers in the household of faith. We rise up from prayer now and take all this to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help me that in my personal family, I will live in a way to make the family a model. And also in my personal ministry, I would minister to make the members of the church, the families in the church, what they ought to be. Let's open our mouths and talk to the Lord in prayer. <laughs>